a wave of pneumonia infections hitting children in China, many of them displaying so-called white lung symptoms. What's behind the outbreak? The connection between California and China is very close. California Governor Gavin Newsom greeted by leader Xi Jinping in Beijing. We examine California's role in shaping U.S. foreign policy. A gas pipeline and telecom cables take damage in Finland, while an ongoing investigation points to one Chinese vessel that it says came a little too close. And growing pressure on Taiwan's presidential election, with one candidate facing a Chinese probe, concerns are rising that Beijing could be trying to squeeze the island's politics. What do you think? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Concerns are rising that there could be another wave of COVID-19 outbreaks in China. That says children showing so-called white lung symptoms flood Chinese hospitals. Here's more. China is seeing more children infected with mycoplasma pneumonia. Media reports say many children are developing fevers and even so-called white lung symptoms. To clarify, it doesn't mean the patient's lungs have turned white. The white appearance on CT scans indicate fluid and infection in the lungs. Healthy lungs should appear black on CT scans. Many COVID-19 patients in China developed this white lung phenomenon last year, though it's unclear if this wave of symptoms is being caused by COVID-19. A pediatrician inside China said the current infection wave is mostly asymptomatic. Many children have been found to have lower pneumonia on their CT scans, even though they may or may not have had a fever and only coughed for a few days. Some children only had fever symptoms, others only had a cough. Some children only got mild fevers and coughing, but CT scans show they're infected with pneumonia. A doctor working at Hunan Children's Hospital told the Epoch Times that his hospital is overflowing. He said many children there have the white lung symptoms, and that due to the overcrowding, it takes three or four days to get a bed in the hospital. Over in central China, another doctor at the Zhengzhou Children's Hospital told the Epoch Times that his hospital is also flooded with children infected with mycoplasma pneumonia. He urged parents to get medical attention early on if their children develop a fever, given the widespread white lung phenomenon. Beijing CDC said mycoplasma pneumonia infections in the city are expected to peak in November. Zooming in on a surprise meeting, California Governor Gavin Newsom met with China's leader Xi Jinping in Beijing on Wednesday. Newsom is on a tour of China to push for climate cooperation. While there, he's receiving praise from Beijing's state media mouthpiece, known for a history of criticizing U.S. politicians. Why? Let's find out. Newsom's trip is drawing attention as it comes amid heightened tensions between the U.S. and China. During the talks, Xi touted the relationship between China and California. The connection between California and China is very close. With a focus on climate, Newsom expressed his desire for continued collaboration and partnership. We're not going to move the needle on climate change unless the United States and China collaborate together. Yet, retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Robert Spaulding cast doubt on that effort. The thing that China offers, the Chinese Communist Party offers uh, people like Gavin Newsom, is the fact that they can have slave labor, they can have incredibly polluting environment. China doesn't care about the environment. Climate cooperation between the U.S. and China has stalled in recent years, with Chinese officials linking it to broader diplomatic and trade disputes between the two sides. Among other issues, Newsom raised human rights concerns in a separate meeting with Chinese officials before he sat down with Xi. So he's trying to strengthen his bona fides with the tech industry. What he doesn't realize is the Chinese Communist Party has no interest in a better relationship. And so ultimately he's undermining the national interests of all Americans. A new editorial published Monday by the Global Times, Beijing's state media mouthpiece, praised Newsom, saying, quote, it is always a pleasure to greet a friend from afar. California has an economy larger than most countries. Governors of the state have a long history of partnering with China. 
Finland is investigating a damaged gas pipeline. And according to an official statement last Friday, a Chinese vessel has become the top suspect. The pipe took on damage in the Gulf of Finland early this month. Early this morning, the border guard found clear damage in the pipeline. So it was not a leak. It was clear damage, the history of which, in the light of the information we have, appear to have been caused by an external operator. The vessel has been linked to both the time and location of the damage. Police also found a lost anchor at that location, leading them to investigate what ship it belonged to. Now, Finland says the Chinese ship is at the top of the suspect list. Beijing said it would provide information to the probe to comply with international law. The pipeline damage is a huge loss for Finland and its partner nations. Well, repairs are expected to take at least until the end of April next year. Yet another visitor has arrived in Beijing this week, Colombian President Gustavo Petro. He met with Chinese leader Xi Jinping during the trip, which marks the new leader's first visit there since he took office last year. Let's zoom in. The two countries elevated their relations during the trip Wednesday. They established ties back in 1980. The upgrade means China now has strategic relations with 10 of 11 South American countries it's tied to. Beijing is stepping up upreach efforts in the South America, Central America and the Caribbean in recent years. The region is home to several countries that have no formal ties to China and instead recognize democratically governed Taiwan as a sovereign state. Paraguay is the last South American nation that has ties with Taiwan and one of just 12 worldwide. The Chinese Communist Party claims Taiwan is part of mainland Chinese territory, though it has never ruled the island. Colombia is also among the closest U.S. allies there. China has become Colombia's second biggest trading partner after the United States in recent years. Though experts point to the large deficit between them, totaling $8 billion in China's favor last year. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese making an appearance at the White House Wednesday. Speaking about the war in Israel, he told U.S. President Joe Biden that American leadership is indispensable, but it is not inevitable, noting it takes true leadership to seek peace. Our alliance between Australia and the United States and the way that we stand steadfast against aggression, whether it be Russia's illegal invasion of uh, Ukraine, or whether it be Hamas's terrorist attack on Israel is something that uh, can be relied upon. His trip is classed as a state visit, the highest diplomatic honor for visiting allies. The two countries are also expected to make new agreements to deter and compete with China, including the launch of an undersea internet cable project and maritime wharf infrastructure funding. Both could help woo Pacific Island nations as the U.S. and Australia work to safeguard a free and open Indo-Pacific region. At the same time, both are working separately to thaw tensions with Beijing. But China is working very hard to infiltrate and suborn uh, vulnerable nations in the South Pacific, to isolate Australia, to isolate uh, New Zealand. All of these uh, moves threaten American interests as well. Albanese will visit China early next month. Friendly action between China and Australia is raising eyebrows. The Australian government has decided to keep China's 99-year lease of its Darwin port. Revealed in an announcement last Friday, the northern city of Darwin holds significant military value to Australia and its close ally, the U.S. Eight years ago, Australia's Northern Territory government inked the lease of the port to the China-based Land Bridge Corporation. At that time, U.S. Marines had already began annual rotating missions across the city of Darwin. For now, Canberra says current regulation is enough to mitigate any possible security risks at the port of Darwin. That's despite warnings from the U.S. that China could use it to monitor nearby military activities. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is set to begin his first China visit early next month. According to the Chinese Foreign Ministry, he'll meet with leader Xi Jinping and seek to expand trade with Beijing. 
Top Apple iPhone supplier Foxconn reportedly under a tax probe from Beijing. The move comes as the head of the Taiwan-based company just announced his decision to run for president of the island. At the same time, Taiwan's vice president, also a front-runner in the island's presidential race, is calling on Beijing to, quote, cherish Taiwanese companies. Watch. This is the behavior where both sides can only lose. Lai's comment comes as another presidential candidate is urging China to clarify what its tax investigation is really about. China claims to be a world power. Regarding a matter such as this one, it should come out and explain itself. Are they specifically targeting Foxconn or are they generally investigating certain companies? They should explain this. Most of Foxconn's factories are based in China. An expert from Taiwan told NTD that he believes Beijing's probe ties into politics and that the Chinese regime is trying to pressure Foxconn founder Terry Guo into quitting the race for Taiwan's next president. The Chinese Communist Party wants Guo to withdraw from the election, or they want him to accept their integration arrangement with mainland China. Not just Harry Guo, but this is the case for almost all Taiwanese businessmen, and even for all foreign businessmen. If you have benefited from China, you cannot criticize China. According to Li, the Chinese Communist regime closely monitors Taiwanese presidential elections, aiming to manipulate the island's election results. The Chinese regime claims Taiwan as its own territory, despite never having ruled the island. It has vowed to annex Taiwan by force if necessary. Religious freedom, the universal right to freedom of thought, conscience, and belief is the basis for a U.S. statute. Passed in 1998, the law is as relevant today as it was then. Commissioners and lawmakers met this week to mark the 25th anniversary of the bill's passage and suggest next steps moving forward. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more. It's been 25 years since the U.S. passed the International Religious Freedom Act into law. It put an ambassador at large for international religious freedom in place and established a bipartisan commission called USERF to monitor the worst violations and report annually on the consequences. We were among the first to call for recognizing China's horrific persecution of Uyghurs as a genocide. We continue to call out Russia for its anti-Semitic rhetoric and Holocaust distortion in an effort to justify Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And last week, we condemned the brutal terrorist onslaught by Hamas, whose anti-Semitic charter justifies violence and worse against innocent Israelis. And we iterated that invoking any religion to justify taking innocent lives has no place in any society. The 1998 law made religious freedom or belief a higher priority when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, gave influence over the U.S.'s refugee and asylum policies, and strengthened advocacy for those being persecuted for their beliefs. USERF Vice Chair Frederick Davey says he and his fellow commissioners are interested in organizing and participating in a national prayer service in response to the crisis in the Middle East. A national prayer service uh, that uh, called for um, an acknowledgement of the brutality and the horror and the depravity that has taken place in the region, uh, calling for compassion for human life and innocent lives in the region. Former U.S. Representative and USERF Commissioner Frank Wolf, the bill's author, shared some advice to those taking the torch. I think you have to keep it bipartisan. He says the faith community in the U.S. needs to get more engaged and that young people on college campuses need to be educated and motivated. I don't believe we can have people lobbying law firms in town lobbying for China when they're committing genocide against Uyghur Muslims and taking organs out from the Falun Gong and taking down crosses from Catholic churches and arresting Protestant house church leaders and and doing that. So I think one recommendation that Congress should take is ban lobbying for China and then ban lobbying for any country that is a CPC designated country for four years straight. Congressman Gus Bilirakis thanked the commission for standing up on the issue and for creating tools to hold violators accountable for their actions. USERF says its efforts have resulted in sanctions, the release of prisoners, and changes in other countries' laws and policies, as well as broad issues of international religious freedom or media and public attention. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. 
Coming up, a submarine arms race is heating up. China's reportedly near breakthrough in developing a new generation of the underwater weaponry fitted with nuclear capabilities. It's touted as quieter and faster. And for the first time, it could pose a real threat able to strike the continental U.S. What does the development mean for the power dynamic between Washington and Beijing? To dive deeper, we hear from Rick Fisher, senior fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center. More on that after the break here on China in Focus. Welcome back to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A new generation of underwater weaponry, nuclear armed submarines. China is reportedly on the verge of a major breakthrough, partly aided by Russian technology. How will this development enhance China's power projections? And what does the arms race mean for the global military landscape? We speak to Rick Fisher, senior fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center, for more. Rick Fisher, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be back on the show. Tiffany, thank you for having me back again. We are hearing reports that China is near a breakthrough in their nuclear armed submarine technology. Now, reports are saying this is using Russian technology. It's much quieter and it has a farther range that could hit the U.S. How seriously should we take these reports? Tiffany, we should take these reports very seriously. Uh, an, an excellent report out of the American U.S. Naval War College uh, details uh, how uh, China is applying uh, Russian technology to advance their third generation of nuclear attack submarine and nuclear ballistic missile submarine as well. Uh, the technology uh, is part that, that makes all the difference is uh, sound isolation technology. Uh, uh, the United States has long used uh, systems that uh, within the submarine, isolate uh, the floor or, or, or create a raft, if you will. And the raft is attached basically to the submarine hull with uh, uh, sound suppressors. And uh, the, the, the Soviets copied this technology uh, or developed it on their own and very likely have sold it to China. Now, they may not have sold their most modern sound isolation technology to, to China, but they have sold other uh, critical technology for submarines like hull welding technology. All of this is probably being improved upon by Chinese engineers. How much damage could they do? Could they actually hit the U.S.? These submarines only have to uh, undertake patrols close to Chinese territory in order to be able to launch their missiles and conduct nuclear strikes against the United States. It is likely that the Type 096 will, will not only have uh, a better version of the JL-3, but will be quieter and thus even more capable of uh, conducting successful patrols close to China in protected waters where they can launch these missiles that are still capable of striking the United States. This is a, a very significant advance for China's ballistic missile submarine technology, which previously had uh, sh much shorter range submarine launch ballistic missiles and thus had to travel out into the Pacific Ocean where they were much more vulnerable to American submarines. And with all of these advances, can the U.S. detect them and intercept them in time? Well, it's more risky now because American submarines now have to get much closer to Chinese territory where the Chinese can launch anti-submarine aircraft or, or lay fields of uh, o uh, ocean bottom moored uh, sonar listening devices uh, to triangulate uh, aircraft strikes against our submarines. In terms of the technologies used, we know there's the Russian tech, but are there any reports of U.S. tech or U.S. chips as part of these new submarines? Tiffany, not, not that I'm aware of, uh, but uh, when China steals uh, an advanced uh, uh, computer program uh, uh, related to uh, uh, combat system control, there's really 
little that uh, we can do from an, an open sector perspective to verify whether this is also improving China's uh, uh, submarines. But uh, just simply looking at these submarines, uh, the uh, second generation submarines very clearly incorporate improvements that have been pioneered by uh, Western submarines. And now military experts are saying China's latest developments could probably come into play in 10 years. With these developments, how does this fit into the U.S.-China power dynamics globally? As we go into the 2030s, we'll be looking at a much larger Chinese nuclear submarine fleet, probably uh, approaching 30 submarines, maybe more. And in addition to that, probably 60 or 70 uh, uh, non-nuclear submarines. And this will put great pressure on the American Navy, which has been very hard pressed to maintain levels of about 50 nuclear submarines, even though our planning documents say we should have at least 66. But going into the next decade, we're going to need more than that. We're going to need 70 or 80 submarines to be able to deter a globally deployable Chinese Navy. What must the U.S. do now to shore up those defenses? Well, the United States basically needs everything, as, as do our allies. Uh, a, a far larger Navy is only one component of what we're going to require to be able to deter a globally deployed People's Liberation Army. But the submarine component of that deterrent capability always has been crucial, important. It's been an important advantage that the United States has had over China, and it is definitely worth investing to keep that advantage. Rick Fisher, thank you so much for your time. Tiffany, thank you. That's all for today's China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. If you have any feedback on the show or have something you'd like to see us cover, send us an email at chinainfocusntd.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.